here it is the a to z nacs tesla supercharger standard to ccs adapter for use in tesla superchargers to charge currently a ford or a rivian vehicle there are some very good reasons to purchase this unit and one very important reason why you may not want to let's get into it Welcome back to eHermes, your electric adventure travel channel. Please remember to subscribe, hit the like button, and hit that bell button to be notified of our upcoming content. Why would you want to purchase this since at least Ford and Rivian are both going to send you one for free? Well, the main reason is this one is available now. I ordered this less than a month ago, and they say the lead time is even being reduced from that, so you could probably get one in a couple weeks. Number two, it's relatively inexpensive. Now, Ford and Rivian are giving you one for free, so anything's more expensive than that, but it's under $200. Number three, there's been a lot of testing done that shows that it really does allow you to charge at the superchargers with either your Rivian or your Ford. Now, for the reason you may not want to purchase it. Both manufacturers are very clear that they do not recommend use of third party, which this is, charging adapters. In fact, they, in some cases, say it may void the battery warranty. Whether that would be enforceable if they could pr couldn't prove that the adapter actually caused damage to the battery is debatable, but still, is that a fight you want to have with a car company? Now, most people say, well, it's just a dumb device. It only passes power through. It doesn't do anything. It can't possibly damage the battery. That's wrong on two levels. First of all, it is not just a dumb pass-through device. It actually has two temperature sensors in it, which we'll get to in a moment. More importantly, the cable for a Tesla supercharger version three and four, which is all we were able to use, is liquid cooled. This obviously is not liquid cooled. Anytime you add a length or make connections in electrical circuit, you increase the resistance, which can increase heat. That's the big concern. Will this device cause the battery to get overheated during Tesla supercharging? We're going to do a test shortly to find out about that, but the short answer is probably not for three very important reasons. First, as I mentioned earlier, the A to Z adapter has two temperature sensors in it. They are passive, so they may not be considered smart, but they're certainly there, and they are designed to cut off power if it overheats. Number two, the Tesla supercharger has a temperature sensor in it that is designed to cut off power if it overheats. And finally, both vehicles have temperature sensors in them that reduce flow if the battery is getting too hot. So the chances of it happening are extremely limited. The test we are going to perform is we are going to take these two vehicles, both with rather large batteries. The Ford has about 131 kilowatt hour battery. The Rivian about 143-ish kilowatt hour battery. We're gonna take them to a Tesla supercharger. We're going to use the adapter. We're going to charge them from 20% to 80% consecutively with no time in between to, to try to create the most flow we can get and the most heat buildup we can possibly get through the device. It'll be about 80 degrees when we do the test. It's partly cloudy, so I'm not sure if it'll be in the sun or not. But we will check the temperature of the handle of the device and look at the battery uh, indicator temperatures on the vehicles. up the Tesla app. I, I'm not going to use plug and charge. I've got the Tesla membership for $13 a month, I think it is. It gets you quite a bit off. It's actually cheaper than Electrify America with their network, even with their discount. So we're going to charge here at the Astero charger. We are at 4D. So I scroll over. I click 4D. Now they say this is where you're supposed to do things in. First of all, take the Tesla supercharger adapter, make sure the latch is open, slide it in, and there's a latch here. You have to get the latch. A lot of people don't do that, and then it won't work. 
And this is, I talked about heat buildup and connections. One of the reasons for this latch is to keep this connection tight so it doesn't get loose. All right, the next thing we do then is we plug this whole thing into the vehicle. It clicks in place. Then we click start charging on the phone. Let's see what happens. It says it's initiating a charger. What percentage were you to on the battery? You don't remember? All right, 17% we're starting at. We're gonna go to 80%. And then as soon as she's done, I'm gonna take the truck from over there, bring it over here, slam it on there right away. May not even uh, cancel the session. I don't know if I have to or not. But that's the goal, so let's see how this goes, see if anything gets hot. We said we were going to charge, uh, we're already up to 20%. We said we we're gonna charge from, it was 17 to 80%. It is charging at a very steady 201 kilowatts. 521 miles an hour, which is kind of a misleading statistic. I'm not sure why everybody focuses on that, but it's very steady, very flat. Doesn't have a big peak. It stayed over 201 kilowatts past 50% battery capacity. You can see towards the end, it really tapered off as the battery got fuller, but we did get 93.6 kilowatt hours in 38 minutes, which means we averaged from 17% to 80% we averaged 148 kilowatts, which is by far the best I've ever done with any charging, either the Tesla Model Y or the Lightning. Okay, we switched out the vehicles quickly. We're gonna go ahead and get this plugged in right away. Get it started. And we're off. As you can see, the Lightning did not do nearly as well. It started out around 105 kilowatts, but then settled in in the mid 90s for most of the charging session. I think it's fair to say that both the charging station and the truck's cooling fans are working hard to keep it around 95 kilowatts. I do not believe it was the adapter that caused the Lightning to have low charging speeds. It was hot when it arrived, it sat in the sun while we were charging the Rivion, and the air temperature was in the mid 90s. Regardless of the cause, the truck did exactly what it was supposed to do. It limited the charging speed to keep the temperature in the safe range. In just under an hour and a half, we put 175 kilowatt hours through that adapter. Well, we're back. Now that we've seen how it works, the question becomes, should you purchase one of these adapters or not? I think the answer is a very definitive maybe. I think it really depends. If you are getting by right now, and if you have a Ford in particular, and you have an early date for delivery for your Ford provided adapter, Keep your $200, don't risk putting your warranty at risk. Even if it's a small risk, is that a fight you really wanna have? If you're not traveling a lot, if you don't have a lot of places to go, if you don't have a big trip coming up. However, on the other hand, if you have a large trip coming up, like we do, where you're going to be traveling a lot and need access to as many charges as you can get, I think it's safe to go ahead and give it a try. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this video looking at the new A to Z Typhoon NACS to CCS adapter for Tesla superchargers. If you did, please hit that like button. As always, please subscribe and please hit that bell button to be notified of our upcoming content. Thank you!